There's arguably more realism than magic in Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Death Constant Beyond Love. He uses this story to deal with some of his, uh, his favorite themes of political corruption, social stagnation, uh, the kind of, oh, uh, human depravity on certain levels that uh, bring everybody else down. Uh, largely, again, uh, a, a function of government, what he sees as a wholesale um, revulsion uh, uh, among the political class in his time in South America, in Colombia primarily. The, uh, the story is of a, uh, a senator who is going to visit this small village that presumably he represents uh, and he is up for re-election and so he is going on this little uh, tour and he's holding an event in this little visit uh, village that you get a sense is a is a real backwater um, uh, an illusory village which by night was a furtive wharf for smuggler ships and on the other hand in broad daylight looks like the most useless inlet on the desert facing a sea that was arid and without direction and so far from everything no one would have suspected that someone capable of changing the destiny of anyone lived there um, so you get the sense, you know, not a real thriving cultural uh, metropolis. It is, uh, that is the second sentence. The first sentence introduces Senator Onesimo Sanchez uh, and uh, sets up the primary conflict of this story. Well, the, the, the setting of it, the context. Um, he has been given uh, a death sentence, essentially. He is dying. Uh, he had six months and 11 days to go before his death, which is an odd little uh, specificity. Uh, his doctors must be really quite remarkable that they can pinpoint it like that. Um, it is not explained exactly why he's going to die. Who knows? Maybe he's going, maybe he's I don't know, maybe he's going to be killed on that day and he is contracted for it. I don't know. Uh, but it is an odd little curiosity right in the middle of the very first sentence. Um, and it was on this day, six months and 11 days before his death, which is just looming out there as a fact, that he has met what, the, uh, what Garcia Marquez calls the woman of his life. Uh, which, again, sounds a little bit curious. Maybe there's a translation issue there. I'm not really sure. Uh, I, I don't have the, the original in front of me. Gregory Rabassa translated this as he, as he did uh, uh, some of the, the greatest translations of Garcia Marquez uh, and, and many of the, uh, the giants of that era, including his most famous... Uh, um, what is it, 100 Years of Solitude? So I'm going to give Rabasa a lot of uh, leeway on this. He can translate however he wants. Um, but there is a curiosity in that first sentence. Senator, Senator Onesimo Sanchez had six months and 11 days to go before his death when he found the woman of his life. Um, in that, you get the contrast of life and death. He has been told he's going to die, and yet, cruelty of cruelties, you know, he finds the woman of his life. Uh, if this is like, you know, the great love of his life, okay, fine. By couching it in that term, the woman of his life, that seems a little curious. That just makes it sound strange uh, and shifts it into that, uh, that, that made strange mode of, Russian formalism or the uncanny of Freud and makes you just sort of push back a little and say, well, you know, what's going on there? What, what exactly is being said? Uh, but that also that, that simple declared fact of death is out there and it is so definite 
that we can say that it is six months and 11 days away. That's just, you know, uh, that's oddly concrete. That's oddly realistic, perhaps, um, in its uh, inescapability, uh, the sense that this is an absolute fate waiting there. Um, hmm. There's a lot you can go with that. Um, fate is obviously a very big part of this story. He is, uh, Senator Sanchez is repeatedly um, uh, quoting, uh, 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 what was it, Marcus Aurelius and his stoic philosophy of just giving in to fate. And he is repeatedly ignoring that same philosophy by his own political declarations and, you know, uh, claims of power over fate and the ability to um, escape it. Uh, we are given the uh, very amusing little anecdote that, you know, uh, he, had been he had been graduated from Gottingen with honors as a metallurgic engineer and was an avid reader, although without much reward, of badly translated Latin classics. Uh, badly translated Latin classics. That sounds like Marcus Aurelius in perhaps a bad translation. Um, hmm. Curious that uh, Garcia Marquez is putting a little bit of the onus on the literature itself. Perhaps he has been miseducated in Aurelius, so therefore he doesn't really understand the, uh, the weight of the ideas that he's dealing with. Uh, the weight of the attitude, uh, the stoic attitude towards fate uh, and, and destiny and whatever you want to call it. Uh, but he is, from the beginning, uh, put in this position where he, he's in kind of a, a, a liminal spot with regard to fate. We are told, as I said in the very beginning, that he has death waiting six months and 11 days out there this giant monolith of fact waiting for him. Uh, and yet, he is on this little tour and he is uh, ginning up all the artificiality he can and living within this bubble of uh, denial, uh, essentially. Instead of accepting fate, as Marcus Aurelius would have him, he is denying everything. Uh, and, and here, Garcia Marquez can bring in politics, because he, he looks uh, with a very, uh, I guess the phrase would be a gimlet eye, at the cheesy showmanship of political campaigns. Um, <clears throat> in talking about this event. It was an unavoidable stop in the electoral campaign he made every four years. The carnival wagons had arrived in the morning. Then came the trucks with the rented Indians who were carried into the towns in order to enlarge the crowds at public ceremonies. A short time before 11 o'clock, along with the music and rockets and jeeps of the retinue, the ministerial automobile, the color of strawberry sh soda arrived. Senator Onesimo Sanchez was placid and weatherless inside the air-conditioned car, but as soon as he opened the door, he was shaken by a gust of fire, and the shirt of pure silk was soaked in a kind of light-colored soup, and he felt many years older and more alone than ever. Um, first of all, I really love the word weatherless. In, in that, it just jumps out. It is a curious little confection of a word. Uh, I'm not sure what the original Spanish was. Uh, I, I get a sense that, uh, again, Rabasa, you gotta trust him, uh, but that little neologism uh, that he just sort of conjures, weatherless. Can you imagine uh, any reality uh, so artificial? as one that can deny weather. Um, 
it's it's hysterical but he is sitting in this air-conditioned car and you have to remember the setting is very important this is Colombia this is a very warm climate and you get the sense throughout that it is somewhat brutal conditions uh, there is this is a constant in uh, in Garcia Marquez's fiction the uh, the effect of the climate um, and uh, what it does to the perspective of the people and the reality of life and the senator is just ignoring all of it or at least trying to but the minute he gets out of that car amid all of the fake trappings that he has set up around him uh, to make it look like this is a prosperous world that he is delivering he is immediately drenched in sweat. Um, I love the light colored soup line. Um, I love the fact that his shirt of pure silk which get, gets a sense of it being very uh, elegant and also very light uh, is immediately heavy with sweat, soaked with sweat. Uh, and that sense of heaviness and lightness is played throughout again more uh, more polar opposites that you see just played off one another the weather is always very heavy the atmosphere is always very heavy and he can try and deny it but everything falls um, he has this cheesy little event he um, he, uh, he is uh, he, he speaks his speech very robotically uh, we are told that he feels a strange disdain for those who are fighting for the good luck to shake his hand uh, you can see the contempt Garcia Marquez has for political figures of this type um, and the uh, the reality of it quite frankly this is not he's not just He's not drawing a cartoon figure here so much as uh, just looking carefully at the people trotting across the public stage. And uh, it would be it would be a nice day when any country could be rid of these kinds of charlatans. But it's the reality of politics. He gives a speech with the a uh, remarkable first line that beginnings and endings uh, declares one of the central problems of his psychology when he says we are here for the purpose of defeating nature he began against all his convictions so even he doesn't believe it but he has declared that they are there to defeat nature we will no longer be foundlings in our own country orphans of God in a realm of thirst and bad climate exiles in our own land we will be different people ladies and gentlemen we will be a great and happy people um, he's kind of lying to them saying you know we're gonna change we're going to escape this uh, this land that we're in the climate is something that we can master the climate is something we can rise above um, and so as a prop to illustrate that uh, his uh, his campaign aids threw clusters of paper birds into the air and the artificial creatures took on life started to drift around paper birds paper birds artificial nature uh, flying supposedly into the air uh, it's all a sham but again it's that sense of the artificial launching off and in that there is that little hint of magic when it says that they uh, took on life there is that little hint of magic in the magical uh, flew about the platforms of planks and went out to sea. Um, little flicker, 
as if he's Garcia Marquez has laid a very careful realistic groundwork in here and now suddenly for people who might be reading him for for that little moment for that little moment of wonder and bizarreness it's like whoop, a little something took on life speaking metaphorically sure um, maybe I'm making too much of that, but I think this is him just sort of winking in this direction. Like, you know, okay, here's a little something. You came for this. I'm going to just uh, tease you a little with it. Um, it goes on. The senator prolonged his speech with two quotations in Latin in order to give to give the farce more time. He's just sort of tossing out Latin expressions. The appearance, remember he's the one who doesn't read particularly good translations and probably doesn't understand them, but he is tossing out little Latin phrases which nobody can probably understand. He probably doesn't understand, but they're just sort of filling time. Filling the, filling the air with noise essentially to stretch out the speech and make it seem more than the thin soup that he's offering. He promised rain-making machines, defying nature, defeating nature, uh, portable breeders for animal tables, the oils of happiness which will make vegetables grow in saltpeter and clumps of pansies in the window boxes, always defeating nature. The attempt to. Uh, it's all so artificial. It is all so, it's all a lie. He's saying, you know, oh, he's promising these things. We can do this. We can defeat. You have a barren patch of land that you're sitting on here, people, but we're going to make it, you know, we're going to pave these streets with gold. This is just perfect. Uh, we, we just have to apply good old fashioned ingenuity and it'll just be a heaven on earth. Trust me. But first, you gotta vote for me. Um, it's just sad, and he knows it. He even sees as the uh, as the campaign is setting up these preposterous cardboard uh, uh, storefronts and houses and all of these facades that make it look like a thriving little village and and even has the nerve to bring in a uh, a cardboard cruise ship like it's going to become a hub of tourism and it's just absurd but even he knows how absurd it is because he can see that the cruise ship model, the cruise ship facade, the cardboard cutout, if you will, of a fantasy. Uh, only the senator himself noticed that since it had been set up and taken down and carried one place to another, the superimposed cardboard town had been eaten away by the terrible climate. The climate. Nature always wins. You cannot defeat it. Give it time. It will defeat you. Nature and fate are unavoidable. Nature and fate are uh, more powerful. You can't avoid either, no matter how much you try to deny them. Um, after this event, or during this event, we are introduced to another character, Nelson Farina. Um, Nelson is not a uh, unique um, uh, or a distinct Colombian name, so automatically you get a sense that he's a little foreign, and yet farina means flower in Spanish, so it's a little bit, um, uh, there is a sense of nature there, but still flower is a processing of grain, so you can go crazy with names if that's your thing. Um, <laughs> And he is just sitting back and he's listening and he sort of heard it all. He's a little jaded. Uh, and uh, the, the introduction of him is really pretty uh, disturbing. 
Uh, uh, for the first time in 12 years, Nelson Farina didn't go to greet the senator. He listened to the speech from his hammock amidst the remains of his siesta under the cool bower of a house of unplaned boards which he had built with the same pharmacist's hands with which he had drawn and quartered his first wife. <laughs> You gotta love the ordinary way Garcia Marquez meanders up to that last little bombshell. You know, you get the picture of this guy who's just kind of jaded and sleepy. He's just sort of waking up and he's in his hammock and it's just another day and he's hearing just another speech and you know, it's just not that big of a deal. And the common detail that his hands are, you know, that, that he is a pharmacist and you know, and he's done some carpentry around the house, and you know, he's just an ordinary guy who happened to have drawn and quartered his first wife. <laughs> Which is a, uh, a grisly little detail to drop right at the tail end of a sentence like that, and um, kind of shakes the reader out of uh, the same slumber that you get the sense Nelson Farina was enjoying. Uh, that sleepiness, that jadedness, uh, well, you know, do you really want to be sleepy and jaded like Nelson Farina? Um, do you really want to identify too much with him? That little detail, uh, shakes the reader up and s after that long little introductory sentence, you know, you're getting into the spirit and you're sensing the heat and the laziness and it's so deliciously indolent and then the ugly reality comes out. Whoa. Uh, a little twist of style there. Garcia Marquez is a genius with style. He revolutionizes all of Latin American literature, essentially, for half a century. Um, he's, he, he's, he's, he's just a champ. He's not just Latin America, but you know, for God's sakes, he, he is a, a, a truly global writer at this point. Um, and uh, you get the sense that, okay, he's, he's angling for something. Uh, he, wants, uh, he wants help in getting a false identity uh, from the senator. He's been soliciting the senator for help. It's a little shady. Uh, he wants to perpetuate another lie, another artificiality. Um, significantly, he is not from around here, as the name would imply. He speaks French. Um, so he's a little bit outside. He's a little bit corrupting, perhaps. Um, he, uh, <laughs> he's just watching it all from a distance and he's waiting for his moment. And you get this lovely little scene of after the speech, the senator goes through, starts working the crowd, uh, and all, uh, he starts making bland promises that don't really mean anything, uh, looking for the easiest way that he can... Uh, curry favor with the crowd. He promises uh, some woman says, uh, you know, oh, all I want is a donkey and I've got all these kids and my husband left me because he's a bum and she's standing on a roof, which is a, a wonderful little detail. And you get a sense of like the squalor of this neighborhood, quite frankly. Um, and, 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 and he just, you know, the senator just says, all right, you know, I'll get you your donkey. And he actually has an aide carry out a donkey. I don't know if they ran out to a donkey store right away, but apparently it had already been indelibly uh, marked or perhaps branded uh, with the campaign slogan of the senator so that as she walks to town carrying with her donkey, carrying water or whatever from the well, um, <laughs> it will be advertising him all the time. And, you know, uh, where do you brand a donkey? A donkey is an ass and you brand him on the ass and that's where the political slogan goes. Um, little details, little funny details. Uh, but anyway, 
uh, he comes across Nelson. Uh, the senator comes across Nelson. Doesn't seem particularly interested in him. Like, eh, yeah, okay, you. Uh, you know, they exchange a couple of words. And then Nelson's daughter walks out. Um, and she is quite something, apparently. Um, the senator is somewhat shocked at the beauty. Uh, it is a uh, it is a beautiful peasant girl. She's she's not you know painted in some sort of miraculous way, but. Uh, he sees her in her natural form and although she is painted as protection against the sun wearing heavy makeup apparently and protection against the sun which is defying your defending against nature um, little things there um, and uh, the senator was left breathless. I'll be damned, he breathed in surprise. The Lord does the craziest things. Just another way of saying, you know, ah, fate. Who can figure it out? Um, and he is attracted. And you get the sense that, well, Nelson is sitting there and maybe he notices. The scene cuts right there and you have to wonder what might have transpired after that little moment. Um, but we are not given access to that, so we move on with the narration, and the senator is now in a meeting with the important people of the village. Uh, the landowners, the wealthy, the 1%, if you will. Um, and they are essentially... Uh, telling him, uh, and he is right there with them, they're all just sort of admitting that, well, yes, everything done today was kind of a farce. Uh, nothing's going to change. Everything will be fine. Um, uh, no, 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 no. We, of course, can't eat paper birds, he said. You and I know that the day there are trees and flowers in this heap of goat dung, the day there are shad instead of worms in the water holes that neither you nor I will have anything to do here. Do I make myself clear? They are all uh, agreeing that uh, nothing's going to change. We're not doing anything. It, we are going to uh, continue to tell lies to all the peasants because that's what they really want and uh, we're just gonna do as it's always been done which is exploiting those people it is a political concept of strategic neglect which uh, I wish uh, I wish was unique but is not it is exploitation of the most vulnerable and a perpetuation of a system that keeps all of that hierarchy in place. Um, once again, however, little details. His shirt was soaked with sweat and he was trying to dry it on his body with the hot breeze from an electric fan that was buzzing like a horsefly in the heavy heat of the room. Um, you get a sense of the heaviness uh, that is sort of dwelled upon, the heavy heat. Um, the, the shirt is soaked with sweat, so you get a sense again of the physicality of it. The shirt is probably weighing him down a little bit when he gets when, he get, when his shirt gets sweaty, it gets heavy. Um, it is in opposite. It is all of that heat is in uh, is being you know trying to be ameliorated, but failing to be ameliorated by the electric artificial fan. Uh, in the room, which cannot defy or, or deny nature. Um, all of this is being put as he is saying that, okay, you know, you can't deny reality. So just like climate and weather and fate are reality, so is political corruption and exploitation.
No one answered. While he was speaking, the senator torn it torn a sheet off the calendar and fashioned a paper butterfly out of it with his hands. He tossed it to no, with no particular aim into the air current coming from the fan, and the butterfly flew out of the room and then went through the half-open door. The senator went on speaking with a control aided by the complicity of death. So as he's talking, he's just sort of fashioning this little paper butterfly, which is the same thing as a paper bird that he had just released at the event and then sort of denounced wink wink to everybody uh in that room uh and and he just sort of launches it and we follow it the girl laura the name of uh petrarch's great love uh laura is sitting outside that room and she saw the paper butterfly coming out only she saw it because only she saw it because the guards in the vestibule had fallen asleep on the steps hugging their rifles after a few turns the large lithograph butterfly unfolded completely flattened against the wall and remained stuck there Laura Farina tried to pull it off with her nails. One of the guards, who woke up uh, with the applause from the next room, noticed her vain attempt. It won't come off, he said sleepily. It's painted on the wall. What's going on there? That's curious. There is an awful lot in that little passage. Um, first of all, she's waiting out there in a room with a bunch of soldiers holding rifles. Uh, you know, the, that's a little intimidating. That's a little... Uh, a little ugliness beneath the surface of this very friendly little perfectly peaceable peaceable uh, political meeting uh, but also you get this sense of this bizarre little butterfly like the birds that were seemed to have a little wink of the magic is now flying also uh, I'm not sure how if, if that fan isn't strong enough to cool anyone off at all uh, I'm not sure how strong it would be to guide a paper butterfly entirely out of the room and flatten against a wall. That sounds more like a wind tunnel than a, uh, than a simple electric fan, but put that aside. There is something somewhat bizarre in the peculiarity of it, the, uh, the magic of it, the uncanniness of it, that you're just sort of watching and you think, okay, the paper butterfly, the artificiality of it, is just another mechanism of distraction that he uses all the time. And that lie, that dishonesty, that is the paper butterfly, flattens against the wall and cannot be peeled off. No, it is stuck to the wall, says the soldier, the soldier holding the gun. Uh, you can't get rid of the lie. One more uh, irredeemable insistence of faith. Unavoidable. Um, The meeting breaks up. Laura Farina goes in. Uh, he puts the senator puts his moves on the little girl. She is. T she says that her father sent her there, which is distasteful. I think. Uh, she is. Um, She is wearing a chest belt, a padlock that uh, once the senator and she get close and start to uh, embrace uh, in the office, um, or it's a room, um, it's a little uncertain exactly the setting, but uh, he is clearly looking for a tryst in this room that he was just having a political meeting in. Uh, and uh, sh when they start, when his hands start going even further south in South America, they uh, come across this piece of metal. 
And she says, well, it's a padlock. And he says, well, where's the key? And well, my father has it. He told me to tell you to send one of your people to get it and to send along with him a written promise that you'll straighten out his situation. You do the favor for me and I will let you have my daughter. Which is about as sleazy as it gets. Um, there's <laughs> the senator grew tense, frog bastard. He murmured indignantly as a slur against the French. Uh, then he closed his eyes in order to relax, and he met himself in the darkness. Remember, he remembered that whether it's you or someone else, it won't be long before you'll be dead, and won't be long before your name won't even be left. So here he is quoting Marcus Aurelius uh, about the surrender to fate. And what is he surrendering to fate for? As an excuse to further corrupt his office and as uh, a, a, well, an excuse to let himself go and enjoy the favors coerced though they may be, of this young woman. It has nothing to do with uh, stoicism. I think that's pretty obvious. He is looking to immerse himself in a kind of nature. She is being put in terms of a kind of nature. She is repeatedly um, said to be, she has the dark fragrance of an animal in the woods. Um, she has the mane of a young mare. Uh, her skin was smooth and firm, with the same color and the same solar density as crude oil. Dark girl. Uh, oil is a natural product, let's say. Um, this is, she is in terms, uh, a, a personification of nature of a sort, of the kind of uh, peasant nature that you find in this little backward village and he is there to exploit it and he is trying to immerse himself literally in that nature and so out of desperation he goes and he misreads Marcus Aurelius in order to tell himself that well I should just give in give in to fate it was fate that I should find this girl and, uh, and have the opportunity to rape her. That seems like fate to me. I have no choice. I just have to give in to it. And so I will do this corrupt deal to help this guy cover up his past, and that will allow me to rape the girl. All seems very philosophical to me. Of course, um, this, uh, this leaks out. He dies six months and 11 days later on the button uh, with this having become a full-blown scandal. It's gotten out and he is now uh, re debased and repudiated because of the public scandal. And he goes weeping with rage at dying without her. Uh, weeping with rage at dying is the opposite, once again, of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, it is not accepting fate. It is trying to deny fate, deny nature. Death is very natural. And it's, it's all for a lie. He doesn't, he's infatuated with this girl, but it's hard to believe that he has any particularly genuine feelings for her. Um, and yet he has convinced himself, just like he convinces everybody else that his campaign stops, that he loves her, um, weeping with rage at dying without her. And it's, it's a lie. Now, throughout this story, we have repeated references to a rose also. And, you know, rose symbolism, okay, fine. Uh, Garcia Marquez knows how to play this game just like everybody else. Uh, the village is named after a rose. 
uh, but it's ironic, we're told in the very first paragraph, because no rose could ever grow in this village. Uh, the, the senator carries a rose uh, uh, in his lapel or something, and when he gets off the stump, he, uh, uh, he, keeps, it, uh, he keeps it fresh by uh, stewing it in, uh, uh, in, a, in a glass and preserving it artificially. The, um, it is a, uh, a very artificial piece of nature, let's say. And then she laid on his shoulder with her eyes fixed on the rose. So in that moment of fate where she gives in to him finally, um, she fixates on the image of the rose, on the, uh, the ultimate defiance of nature that is supposed to be some image of love. Now, of course, the title itself gives that away, Death Constant Beyond Love. It's the, uh, it's the reversal of the Quevedo poem, the sonnet that, uh, that declares that love is constant beyond death. And here it's just the more less, well, it's the less idealistic, more grim reality that no, 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 no. Death comes, not love. Love here in this is an illusion. Like anything that is a, uh, uh, like anything that gives hope, perhaps. It's a lie. It's artificial. Um, the nihilism that Garcia Marquez traffics in here, I think, uh, has those brief moments of magic, has those brief moments of some beauty and wonder. And you can get caught up in that. You can get enchanted by that. You can get swept away by that. But at what cost? Because you know it's a lie. Maybe that's what makes ordinary life worth living. It's not like this guy, this senator, has really any control over uh, the, uh, the desolate landscape that he is saying he can transform. It's a lie. But for this little village it's still the best show in town <laughs> it's still the only thing going on you get the sense in that village for a very long time so he's not completely letting anyone off the hook he's saying that yeah this this guy's a huckster and he's peddling a lot of lies but the people are cheering him. At that rally, people are eating it up. That woman is walking her donkey to the well with the campaign slogan on its ass. There is a little complicity there. There's a little bit of uh, um, critique of the society, not just uh, the corrupt officials at the top, but everybody around that. They're buying into it and yeah, there's a little reason for that. Maybe they don't know any better. That woman did get her donkey after all. Um, maybe they should, maybe they should wake up. Maybe they should read more. Maybe they should shake themselves out of the heavy doldrums of South American indolence. But can they? Wouldn't they then be defeating nature or failing to, as the good senator learns? It's an intractable, intractable. It's a tough problem. The uh, the issues with Garcia Marquez are never simple, and he is. 
for all he writes about politics and does so from a particular perspective, um, he is too strong of an artist to lie about it. He understands that, well, nobody has clean hands here. There is enough blame to go around. And yeah, the senator is an easy mark and his characterization is somewhat uh, artificial, just like his facades that he sets up in town. But that doesn't mean he's not true. He is true to that place, that time, that culture. He is true because he is um, corrupt and dishonest. He is true to all places and all times and all cultures. Garcia Marquez leaves it to the reader to decide whether or not you want to be a part of that or whether or not you want to follow your own little paper butterfly and see if it can make a change. <laughs>